That's a... Yeah, it's a healthy pour. Here we go. Hello. The first thought you're probably having is, is this bitch in her bathroom? My name is Emily Borde. My name is Maria Edwards. Hello, I'm Emily Leindecker. My name is A.O. Wesley. Hey, my name is Kevin. And I'm Abby. Yes, I'm ready. <sighs> and my friends and I have decided to utilize quarantine to get together virtually. And today we're going to be, t be talking about the story of George Remus. 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 King of the bootleggers. The Rockefeller of bootlegging. I am camera ready. <laughs> was um, born in Germany, I believe, in 1874. And he actually, him and his family immigrated to Chicago when he was five. Um, and then at 19, he became a pharmacist. Like, he was like, hell yeah, like, this is dope, make pretty good money, and I'm gonna do this. So, fucks with me. After Remus finishes, pharmacy school. He marries a woman named Lillian Kraut. Mm. Kraut? Kraut. And they have a child and the child's name is Ramola. But enough about her. Let's get back to the main story. He's like, I'm a pharmacist now. He does that for a few years and he's like, you know what? I'm not really making a whole lot of money. I'm not making a name for myself doing for this. So, he's like, you know, I like being in the middle of the community and whatnot with the powers of a pharmacist that I have, but it could be better. So, what does he do? He pulls this, like, high school musical thing where he goes to his uncle and he's like, but pharmacology is not my dream. It's your dream. And then... He's like, I'm gonna pursue what I want and put himself through law school at the, like, yeah, when he was a pharmacist, I guess. Yeah, he did like night school and he became a freaking lawyer and like a good one, okay? Like, he was one of the best criminal attorneys in the Midwest. He's representing gangsters and burglars and robbers. Um, those guys don't exist yet? They do exist. Yeah, history is a little murky. <laughs> and at one point, he tries this case where he has a defendant who killed his wife. It's the early 1900s. It happened all the time. So he's like, oh, I killed my wife. And George is like, don't worry about it. I got it. So George then goes into the court and he's like, yeah, he killed his wife, but... He was temporarily insane at the time, which is why he looks fine now. The jury went back and they deliberated. And they were like, you know what? This guy doesn't deserve to die. He was transiently insane. So he got like, I don't know, 17 years in jail or something. Which in the 20s is probably a life sentence. Um... But, uh, but he didn't get the death penalty. And for George Remus, that was a win. He is this crazy, crazy lawyer. And with all of that power comes a lot of, um, attention. So he meets this girl in his office. Her name was Imogene Holmes. So Imogene Holmes was a quote unquote dust girl for... Remus's office. And let's remember that George is married. And he's like, I'll pay for your apartment. I'll pay for your nice clothes and car and whatnot. 
and he has a very open affair with her. And it's uh, what I would assume to be very embarrassing for his first wife and his daughter. After his wife, it Vagine is. Vagine got a platinum vagine. A platinum vagine. <laughs> Subsequently, he gets to buy divorced from his wife, whose name is. I just forgot. I mean, did not write down that part. He gets divorced from his wife. And uh, he and Imogene get married. And then, in 1920, we have the 18th Amendment. The Volstead Act is passed. Okay, the Volstead Act is passed as a result of the 18th Amendment that is passed. Which was instituted on January 17th of 1920. Because it's the Roaring 20s again. <laughs> We're living through another round of this hell. Yes. Volstead Act dictates how prohibition has to be carried out. And all these people are like, we can't drink anymore. What a shame. Whiskey was illegal. And good. This is during prohibition. Alcohol was illegal. And bootleggers There's this judge, his name is Kennesaw Mountain Landis. Yikes. Like, he is super into being a judge. And Kennesaw Mountain Landis <coughs> is like, oh, sorry, like, you're a bootlegger, lol, on you. I'm going to impose the harshest fine. Excuse me. Yes. I can possibly think of and he's like absolutely no bootleggers will pass in this town mm, you're a bootlegger you sell alcohol you owe me money you owe me like ten thousand dollars you owe me like a couple thousand dollars and they'd be like oh i didn't do it and he'd be like i'm pretty sure you did and you owe me this money and then they would just pull out like like so much money. They used to have thousand dollar bills back then, so they would pull out like th literal thousand dollar bills. And then like, how much did you say? Yeah, there you go. And hand it to them in court. And the judge was like, yeah, seems legit. So then George Remus as a lawyer is like, oh, I see the money they're making. I see the money that I'm making. I could be making more money and it would be wonderful if I had more money. He also had a wife at this time who was also into the money. He's like, I'm gonna look into this Volstead Act. Then he read the whole thing, which, I mean, he was a lawyer, so that's not super impressive, but he memorized the whole thing. He's like, OMG. Yeah. He's like, I'm realizing there are some loopholes in the Volstead Act. Oh. Oh. Wow, wow, wow. You can't drink. Like, you can't have a drink unless you're like, unless you're in a religious ceremony. Like, um, what's that thing called? I, I feel ill. Um, that's not what it's called. Um, Communion. <laughs> communion. Unless it's communion. Or, oh, medicinal whiskey. He finds a way because there was thousands, millions, millions of gallons of liquor that had already been made that was put into storage once prohibition hit. And he knew that there were millions of gallons of liquor just sitting there waiting to be bought. So he found a loophole. You have to have a special permit to get it out of these warehouses. One of the only ways you can get a permit is by saying, hey, I'm a pharmacist. Um, I'm going to sell this whiskey for medicinal use. Like the same way that you could get 
like these days you can get medicinal marijuana. And he's like, dude, I'll just sell it medicinally. So he's a pharmacist. So then he's like, where in the country do, is there a lot of alcohol? No one really controls it. And like people really rely on alcohol in order to just get through their day-to-day -day lives. That's all I see. Obviously, Ohio. He moved himself from Chicago to Cincinnati because Cincinnati, within 300 miles, you had all, or like 80 to 90% of uh, the liquor, whiskey uh, distribution places. Ted, you're really distracting me, buddy. But, shock. George Remus created his own drug company. I don't know what it was called. Drug Remus Pharmaceuticals. He creates this whole drug company that's his. Once I buy up all these pharmacies, I'm gonna start my own transportation company. And I'm gonna have my own transportation company putting out all this alcohol everywhere. And then, and then, I'm gonna hire thugs, thugs, and they are gonna rob these shipments. And then they are gonna put them in the black market so I can make even more money. Money. So George starts his process and he calls it the circle because he is at point A, he's at point B, he's at point C. Like he is doing this and he like is so brilliant. He bought every distillery that was currently available that he could find and bought all of their current product, that's that word, product, alcohol. He bought all the alcohol they already made because it was legal to already have made it. You just can't sell it from there. So he was like, I'll take it off your hands. The people hijacked it and took it to back alleys and speakeasies. In order to sell it. Yeah. I also took it to his farm. The number of hands, like hired hands that he had guarding his lands, it ended up like the single road that went into one of his distilleries was known as Death Valley, mm -hmm. just because of the number of gunmen that were like lining the road, ready to like shoot up whoever didn't pay, shouldn't have been there. Um, just kind of this, this crazy wild west meets glitzy like 1920s drama glamour. It looked scary, but like low key Death Valley is like actually really cool. So rum runners would show up to Death Valley, George's farm. And they'd be like, hello, excuse me, I'm really in like to buy a cask of whiskey. And he'd be like, dude, spend the night, like have a home cooked meal. I got a craps game going on in the back, like hang out, have a good time. And, and by 1921, just again, this is just a year in, um, his empire went for a couple years later. He had about 35% of the entire bootlegging market. Just so we're on the same page here, George Remus was already rich before he was a prohibition guy. He had been a really good attorney People paid him a lot of money to get off from their crimes. So, he makes like, in the first three years of him doing this, he's made uh, like $40 million in the 1920s. Which in today's money, I looked it up is like $516 million. That was all his. He literally quoted himself saying, Remus is the liquor business. And I don't remember. He said, I'm making money. I'm making a ton of money. I'm gonna build my wife this marble palace. It's gonna have everything that I want. It's gonna have a pool. He always wanted a pool, and so he builds one. 
and see he names it after his wife, his beloved second wife, and he calls it the imaging map baths, which is creepy. Yeah. Um, it's really creepy. I don't think that's flattering. I think it's creepy. They're spending an obscene amount of money on this house. And 1921, New Year's Eve, 1921, they throw the party to end all parties. New Year's Eve of 1921 was the like seriously, like George, he gave out all these amazing gifts. Like guys got these like diamond pin something and then the women got automobiles like they legit got cars like i don't care if it's 1920s i don't care if it's 2020s send me this party i want a freaking new car and he would give people just like gold watches and um like diamond earrings to every woman who attends so then everyone's like coming to his fucking parties all the time because why would you not so basically George and Imogene, they were kind of like new money. So they're trying to like establish mm. themselves, right? They're like, oh, let's let's throw this like totally over the top opulent party. Let's be classy. Opulent. Let's be classy. He is the inspiration for Jay Gatsby in the book written by Scott Fitzgerald, The Great Gatsby. Gatsby. So, how did George Remus maintain this, like, very intense lifestyle? I'll tell you exactly how he fucking did it. It's through bribery. Bingo, bango, bingo. He literally says, everybody has a price. I just gotta find out what that dollar sign is. And guess what, bitch? I have the money to pay for it. So he just basically bought whoever he wanted. State employees, city employees, even federal employees. And as long as I bribe people all the way to the top, the very tippy top up in Washington, no one can touch me. No one. He starts having these secret meetings in New York City with Jess Smith, who was basically like the confidant fixer of the Attorney General under Warren G. Harding's administration. Jess Smith was President Harding's son's uh, kind of good friend. President Harding's son was the Attorney General. Jess Smith was his body man. This skeevy guy that worked for President Harding, uh, he met with Remus and he said, Remus, I like what you're doing, bud. I like it a lot. I say for $2.50 per permit, you can buy as many permits as you want. And you know, that's such a laughable low number for a millionaire like you. Basically, guys, what he was saying is like for a penny per permit. There's nothing. He said you can buy as many permits as you want for $2.50 per permit. And for an additional $50,000, you have anemone. Immunity. Immunity. And Remus said, hey, Remus is going to pay Smith $250,000 over you know a couple of years to protect my ass because that's that's what Remus does Remus takes care of Remus um, which sounded great except it was a crime and criminals get caught all of a sudden you wouldn't expect it boom 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 this little lady her name is Mabel Walker Willebrand. She like flounces onto the scene. She's like, beep, 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 excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. She said, you know what? I'm gonna go to law school. 
I'm going to make a name for myself and I'm going to be a badass bitch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, nine months after women got the right to vote in the United States. This bomb biatch, and like biatch in a good way, Mabel Willow Branch something, or something Willow Branch. Mabel Walker Willebrandt becomes Assistant Attorney General Ooh. at the age of 32. It's 1921. Wow. Like, yeah. she's a BB. She is, like, almost completely deaf. She wears hearing aids. She, like, gets up. It takes her an hour every morning to, like, construe her hair around her ears. She deals with, like, all of these handicaps. Like, she was about prohibition, y'all. Like, she was about it and she was no bullshit. You could not pay this woman off. Like she wanted liquor off the street. She wanted beer, wine off the street. She wanted it gone, okay? And so she got put on his case and was like, shit's not kosher. I gotta, I gotta figure this out. And she pretty much goes after George Remus. So, Part of her job, I guess, was to um, send out these secret agents who were in charge of taking down people who were breaking the law, breaking the prohibition law. One of those names was... Well, it was Franklin Dodge. Dodge is able to build a strong enough case that he's like, okay, it makes enough sense now for us to like raid Death Valley. He tracks the guys back. He arrests the whole squad. He says, you're arrested, you're arrested, you're arrested, you're arrested, you're arrested, and you're all coming with me. And guess what? I also am going to take 40 grand in fines because... Poop on you. Basically, this little narc arrested everybody, even though George Remus had permission from the Smith guy to never get in trouble. But they find all this stuff and they're like, dude, you're the biggest bootlegger we've ever found. We're going to bring you to court. And they got him for three thousand violations of the Volstead Act. And George Remus is like, okay, like great for you. Like I'm super happy for you, but did you forget that Jess Smith is like my friend? So as soon as Remus got like charged guilty he appealed and he runs really quickly to smith guy right and he's like mm, hey smith guy um you literally said if i paid you 50 grand i would never get in trouble for this shit i would never be indicted i would never be arrested what the heck bro what gives and smith is like I, um, well, I mean, yeah, nothing bad's gonna happen. I'm for sure. It's okay. It's all good. It's all good. And Remus is like, mm, you don't seem too sure, but there's another 30 grand just in case. So he goes to court. And they give him this like fucking Brock Turner sentence where he's one of the most infamous people in America. And they're like, we'll give you two years. OMG. So, so then Remus is reading the paper one morning. Oh, you know, do, do, do. Drink my coffee. Not a big deal. Oh, whoa. Um, Smith guy who I've been promising this whole time paying him money, he's been saying I'm good, paying him more money, he's saying I'm so good, so good, so good, so good, so good, so good. Fucking killed himself. Shot himself. 
because he was named in an investigation. And he went to jail in 1925. But like, he was paying people off. The warden, the, the jail people. He was paying them all off. And so he was like, he was like, jail is my bitch. Like, y'all think this shit is hard for me? <laughs> no, because I've paid everyone off and this shit isn't even that bad. But then Mabel found out and was like, you know what? I heard some fishy, fishy crap that's going on in jail. And she's like, this is not cool. Like I sent this guy to goddamn prison and like he's having Man, a vacation out of it, right? So she sends Franklin Dodge undercover to the prison. Franklin Dodge is like, oh, I'm like very much a prisoner. So George is in jail and he is talking to this guy he's like hey man my wife is my power of attorney and she manages all my money and i got a lot of money she can give away all of my money if she wants to that's a weird thing to talk about while you're in jail, but... He sucks as an undercover agent, though. And, like, George realizes that he's an agent. And George is like, oh, Imogene, you know how, like, you come and visit me every once in a while? I need you to start hitting up my man, Dodge, and be like, oh, you're so smart, you're so funny. Because here's the thing is Dodge is going to get me out of here. And she's like, I mean, like, whatever you want, babe. Like, you're the love of my life. I'll do whatever you need. Didn't know doing whatever you need meant doing Dodge Imogen. Imogen is a little lying hoe. And Imogen has gone off with Agent Dodge. She starts having an affair with Franklin mm -hmm. Dodge. But a planned affair. Nope. Remus didn't know about it. Oh shit. She's like, She's um, to yeah, uh, George Remus is kind of like super the worst person and I want to ruin his life. And Franklin Dodge is like, your tits are crazy. Your ass is crazy. I'll do whatever you say. And Imogene's like, okay, here's exactly what I say. Let's do this. They rob him blind. So they sell all his stuff, all his shares, all his warehouses, all his distilleries, everything, everything. While well, this man's in prison and his one true hope was in Imogene. And she's like, ew, I don't even like him anymore. Let's just get the stuff, the money, and go away, Agent Dodge. Anyway, so he's partying up in the jail, having a wonderful time. His wife's stripping up the assets. Um, so then and George was like, hell to the no. Okay, I started this business. I got this business from the ground up. Like I started it. And you're going to take my shit while I'm in jail for making us all this money. Imogen, you are trash. He gets out of jail. When he gets out of jail... He's handed a hundred dollars and divorce papers because Imogene wants to divorce him to go be with Franklin Dodge. And she's like, oh, wait, I'm not into being your wife anymore. And he's like, mm, yeah, I'm like not into being your husband anymore because you were in my life. Okay. I did so much work to get to where I am. And he starts going crazy. And he starts hunting them down. He goes to their house and his house. And just to twist the knife even more, they left a pair of Dodge's shoes sitting in the foyer. That's terrible. So then... George keeps following them for like a whole summer. This is an extended period of time. And he's like, 
running like he's in Tom and Jerry with his little bowler hat on. A bowler hat? Bowler hat. Bowler hat. Yeah. Bowler hat. Yeah. He's running around like Tom and Jerry trying to find his wife. He, he wore a pork pie, let's be honest. So he's following them. It's like that movie, You've Got Mail, where like Tom Hanks walks into a Starbucks and gets a cup of coffee and then leaves and then he holds the door open for Meg Ryan and then she walks in and she's like, I'll have a tall mochaccino. Um, I'm looking for this guy, I can't find him. But like, it's a guy who held the door open. It's like that shit where like they just keep passing each other and like he never finds her. George is super mad. He has smoke coming out of his ears. He said, you know what? Fine. I'm super mad. And he's like, it's time to end this. I don't even want to tell this part. God, okay. It's October 6th, 1927. It's the day of their final divorce hearing. Mm -hmm. He sees Imogen and her, and her daughter, which is his stepdaughter, in a cab while he's in the car. And he's like, driver, follow, th follow them, follow them. The cab driver's just like, okay, runs them off the road. Like, let me know what kind of fucking Uber driver would do that for you now. Runs them off the road. George gets out of the car. He walks up to the car, pulls Imogene out of the car, yanks her up like by the hand, shoves a gun into her midsection. Blam! Kapow, kapow! And he shoots Imogene in the stomach. It's eight in the morning. Pregnant. He shoots her while onlookers watch. Oh. And he's like, this is the best thing that could have happened to my life. This is what I wanted. Life is dead. Within, I don't know, some short period of time, having killed a woman, he turns himself in to the police. And he's like, I did this. I killed her. He said, I did society a favor. This is a two-timing poop. And I helped society by getting rid of her. So George goes to court for this. Of course, cause I mean, he gets arrested for like murder and he decides to be his own co-counselor because let us not forget that before he was a bootlegging genius, George was a lawyer, like a criminal defense lawyer. It's never a good idea. George Remus literally said to the whole court and jury, you know what, I'm such a narcissist that I'm gonna represent myself. He's very charismatic. He knows how to work a crowd. So when he goes to court, his defense is none other than bam, bam, bam. temporary insanity. Correct, but it was called Temporary Insanity. Incorrect. Anyway. What was it called? Transitory Insanity. The court case option defense that worked for him so many years ago. So, he makes his case. He says, I killed her because I'm insane. And let me tell you why I'm insane. And then he proceeds to represent himself to a court and a full jury and explain all of his life tragedies. And so then he's like explaining to the jury, the jury, uh, I don't deserve like a guilty kind of like situation. I'm Please. actually insane. Please, thank you. Uh, I'm insane uh, because life has been really hard for me and like my wife stole everything from me and I'm just like a sad German. Like, let me go on insanity. He has his stepdaughter, Ruth, get up on the stand. He's like, did you or did you not tell reporters, like once that happened, you told them, quote, end quote, my stepfather is acting insane. Yes, I said that. And mm. that's his smoking gun. That's where he proved he was like, oh, yeah, I was temporarily insane. And I've 
I've literally defended this case before. So watch me win. Watch it, watch it. Oh, oh damn. Damn, damn. I'm ashamed that I just did that. Um, the jury took 19 minutes. And then they decide to let him go on insanity. And then the court erupted into applause. They're going crazy. Everyone is going crazy. And George Remus says, American justice. I thank you. The court's like, mm, but you're a young white man and we feel bad for you and you run the world. So like, you can just get off again. And then he spends a very short period of time in an asylum, um, whereas as his asylum days kind of go by, he's like, actually guys, I'm not insane. And this asylum has cured me and I'm totally fine to be back out in society now, even though I killed the woman at close range because she made me angry. Uh, and even though, uh, I don't know, I did all these other crazy things in my life, I'm fine now, let me go. And then they let him go. They released him from asylum. And so he dedicates his time to like, winning back all of the wealth that Imogen stole from him. Um, and he like never found it, which is mildly satisfying. What's also satisfying is that uh, Dodge, the guy who stole his wife and everything he owns, ended up also going to jail for bootlegging, but only for a couple of years as well. But so then George is just continuously trying to win all of that money back. Instead, what he did was he went to Covington, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. Um, he had a stroke. Died in 1952. Exactly. A couple years after his stroke, he died. He finds someone else to marry him. Like, he's on his third wife, which is cr Like, imagine showing up to brunch and being like, I found this guy. He's amazing. But here's the thing. He's been in jail. He has no money, and he murdered the last woman he dated. But I think he's the one. And all of her friends are just like, yeah, sounds great, marry him. The story is insane. And like, the American justice system is different because of this guy. And also, one of the best stories so it's very interesting. I feel like I skipped a lot, so I hope you guys enjoyed this. Okay, bye. <sighs> got everything. Good job. I got a piece. I got a pee. That's the story of George Remus. I'm going to bed. It's kind of not a lot about Remus. And that is the story of George Remus, the king of the bootleggers. King of the Boomer.